has to change for his passing. But more importantly, let us acknowledge that each of our lives will be better for having known the Lord for Jesus. We come together to commemorate his impact on all of us. I'd like to now invite forward several speakers that have offered to share remarks about Lord for Jesus. A man of love, a man of humor, a man of greatness, a man of creativity, was taken from us way, way too suddenly. But his life was not taken from us. The definition of the word life is the animate extinction of the individual. Arthur Gujic may never walk down the halls of Beecher High School again, but his legacy will. That right there, his legacy, is his life. Mr. Kujic's life has continued through our memories with him because life is an ongoing thing even after you pass away. We keep Mr. Kujic's life alive by remembering the lessons he taught us inside and outside of the classroom. We remember all the hilarious jokes and the puzzles and the riddles he shared with us. We remember his stories and experiences of his world travelings. We remember that he was so much more than a math teacher, but a life teacher. We remember the kind ways, we remember his wiseness, and we remember his legend status that kept him up, that kept that would keep his life alive. Hello, my name is Joseph Spiro. I'm a junior here at Beachwood, and I was a current student of the book of Mr. Gugu. I would like to take this time to pay my condolences to the Gugu family and his girlfriend, Barbara Becker's family. We lost two great people, and great is an understatement. It's such an unnecessary and horrific accident. I think a couple of words that describe Mr. Gugu perfectly is an adventurous, all-knowing practicalist. The reason I say this is, Mr. Kujic knew that there be, may be 1,000 different ways to do a math problem, but he taught his students the most practical way. Not the easiest, but the most practical. But the thing that is so impressive is that he knew every every one of the other 999 other ways to solve that exact problem. Staying after school and just talking with Mr. Kujic about life was the highlight of my week and of my year. Another example of him being practical is when he realized his students were abusing the bathroom, their bathroom privileges. So he took, you know, Mr. Kujic put a big old mesh office supply holder in the back of the room so that this would be you know, known as his bathroom pass and only one student could leave the room at a time as they would heave it to the bathroom. It was as simple as, you know, if the supply holder wasn't in the back of the room, you couldn't, you had to wait until the person came back. So of course, he hooked a little pur Purell bottle to it because, you know, it's the bathroom. That's just the humor and the energy that Mr. Kujic supplied on a daily basis. Mr. Kujic was his adventurous self when it came to his travels, his, youth of, his use of street smart, his humor, and of course, inside these walls of Beecher High School. He literally, on the first day of class, before even saying a word to any of the students, solved a Rubik's Cube behind his back. He was definitely not afraid to step outside of his comfort, his, his comfort zone and 
the box. When it came to educating, as we all know. For example, the week before spring break, we were learning how to divide polynomials. And she noticed a downhearted vibe throughout the classroom during the lesson. He stopped teaching and said to us, I know this year has been rough for many different reasons, but there's only one way we are going to fix that. It is if we come together as a singular tribe. He referenced the 12 tribes and that everyone that is in a tribe has something in common and that's why people and tribes work well together. It could be the most simple of things like making the same song or working, to, working together to help others. So we shared with our class that, was sitting in the, that, was, that he was sitting in his room after school one day grading papers, and he heard some students arguing in the hallway. Mr. Gujib was surprised with what he was hearing, so he invited the students into his classroom. They sat down, and Mr. Gujib presented the students with a book filled with pictures of his one-year-long trip around the world. He then saw the students after and realized the tension had been obviously minimized between them. He came to the conclusion that these two students were now a part of the same tribe when they looked at the book together. So he offered us to find ways to create tribes to make Beachwood High School in the world a better place. He said that any day could be your last, so just be kind. Mr. Kujic saw the potential in his students and colleagues. He was able to, make his, to take his life experiences and project those throughout each and every school day, whether it was in his classroom, in meetings, or in the hallways of Beecher High. He had an impact on his students and people all around the world with his, within the Lego community and so much more. We all saw him as a humble genius, even though he made jokes about how smart he was, but you know, he was pretty humble. I remember seeing him and his girlfriend, Barbara, as he liked to call her his lady friend, at the Beachwood football games, and she attended all kinds of other school functions that he didn't even need to be at, but he felt obligated to come because he was so invested in his students and he cared so much, and obviously people cared about him so much. All he wanted was to make us all part of the same tribe, to make the world a better place. But now, as I stand in front of you, the Beachwood community, Gujik's family, we now follow his vision. We are all now part of the same tribe, as we all remember the great individual who was Arthur S. Gujik. Because his life will never die because of our experiences with him that we remember. Just like how his humor, his authenticity, and his kindness leaves a legacy that will never be forgotten. Thank you. Thank you. 
another month <laughs> after having me in his class. Um, and the emotional stuff came later. But I eventually was put in his tutoring class um, and all that. And I realize now that besides half the reason for me seeing him being that, you know, I was dumb as a bag of hammers in his class, um, I was just so curious about this person. There was something about him that made me want to ask questions, and I'm not usually the type of person to go up and just ask people about their lives. I still have a very long list of questions that I was waiting for just the right time to ask him, because I knew his answers would be so real and thought out and heartfelt. I would pay very good money to listen to this guy speak about literally anything that he wanted to. Um, he's the kind of person where his words are few and far between, but when they are there, they are potent with intelligence. He was unsettlingly intelligent in literally every way. He's the kind of person that makes you think. And being as intelligent as he was, it's funny that I never really found him intimidating in any way. I think we all have something to learn from that. We can be impactful, powerful, intelligent, and valuable in this world without believing that you are above everyone else in the room. You can feel that way without putting others down, but actually lifting them up. You can feel that way by teaching others to ask questions, by having absolute genuine empathy for others and their unique story. He had that with me. One day I had a meeting with all my teachers and counselors to talk about my grades um, and how they had been going lately. And then the talk about, you know, it went in directions of, oh, I guess I don't pay enough attention, or, oh, it's because of my anxiety disorder. I think he was the only person in the room, including besides me, that realized how unproductive that conversation was. Because he said something to me that in my 16 years of life had never hit or affected me so hard that it literally did not function for the rest of the day. He said to me, he looked directly in my eyes, and he said, what does it feel like to be you? Think about how simple that question is. What is it like to walk in your very specific shoes? What is it like to live the way that you do with the people that you live in in your home? The way his eyes looked when he asked that question was so full of admiration and empathy and curiosity. I'm never going to be able to get that image out of my head. In 16 years of sharing my own story to others, of being passed from doctor to doctor to talk about my feelings, which I cannot explain, and I have no reason or excuse for my emotional disorders. Nobody, not one person in 16 years ever asked me that. And it is literally the simplest thing that you could ever ask a person. The empathy that he gave me in that moment was so beyond anything that I had ever experienced. I think it's apparent to everyone, to be quite frank, that sometimes a teacher would lack empathy. And he knew that. And instead of complaining, instead of making a huge political deal out of it and coming up with speeches to lecture to other people, he was the change that he wanted to see in our community. If you were going to take one lesson from him, whether you knew him or not, it should be that. You have every opportunity in your life to be the green light in a sea of red every single day. You have an opportunity every single day to be the purest, most genuine version of yourself and to allow that energy to enter your life so you can appreciate and accept others more. He gave us that talk about tribes that Joe was talking about that has been told time and time again over the last three days. I think it's the most potent and intelligent thing that he's ever talked about. He talked about race, acceptance, politics, and everything controversial in life without making it political or controversial. We are a tribe because of him. We can be a tribe because we as a community learned that empathy each other from him. So look over your shoulder at the people next to you. Smile at them. You are now a tribe with every single person in this room because we are learning from him and experiencing this grief together. We lost a friend, a colleague, a teacher, a family member, a mentor, and a support system. But we did not lose 
what I purely believe he intended to leave us with all along. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm uh, Peter Sokhanov. As we all know, Mr. Gujic was an amazing, funny, and ingenious person. And today I'd like to share something with everyone that he shared with me that I think captured all those traits. This is an algebraic method for generating primitive Pythagorean triples. This is going to get a bit technical, but bear with me. A Pythagorean triple is three numbers such that the square of two add up to the square of the third, like how in 3, 4, 5, 9 plus 16 equals 25. Or another example is 12, 5, and 13. Mr. Gujic always kept this close to his chest because he thought that if this method was generalized past two-dimensional space, it could be used to prove Fermat's last theorem. Fermat's last theorem was an unproven conjecture mentioned in a margin by the French lawyer Pierre de Fermat in 1637. It claimed that there can never be a Pythagorean triple that works for a greater power than squaring, that, for instance, there are no three numbers such that the sum of the cubes of two equal the cube of the third. This theorem has become infamous for the past few centuries, but it was proven by Sir Andrew Wiles in the 1990s. Towards the beginning of the year, Mr. Gujic invited Yang Yu and myself to his room and told us in a hushed tone that he thought this method could be used to present an easier proof of the theorem, one that could be understood by students, and in his words, make us the most famous people on earth. <laughs> for this reason, he always treated it with a sort of humorous secrecy, and for that reason I thought it fitting to present his work today and honor him while, as it were, really revealing his great secret. So he says, I have found an interesting and novel, question mark, way to generate primitive Pythagorean triples. The coordinates of the intersections of two families of parabolas y equals quantity m to the fourth minus x squared over 2m squared, where m is an odd integer, and y equals quantity x squared minus m to the fourth over 2m squared, where n is an odd integer, will generate Pythagorean triples, see graph one, so. <laughs> looks like this, as you see the parabolas intersects at the points that generate the triples. The coordinates of the intersection for any m and n are m, n, m squared minus n squared over 2, c proof 1. For example, if m equals 15 and n equals 9, then the coordinates of intersection become 135, 72. These coordinates generate the triples 135, 72, 153. Then there's a note on notation that's used for the other proofs. The coordinates of any intersection for any m and n yield a triple of the form uh, GCF mn, that's the greatest common factor of m and n squared dot a, b, c, so a, b, and c are being scaled up by the square of the greatest common factor, c proof 2. And if we look at the intersections where uh, GCF, m and n are 1, or m and n are relatively prime, and m is greater than n, which is greater than 0, to ensure solutions are in the first quadrant, then the coordinates of intersection yield italics, only primitive Pythagorean triples, c table 1 and c graph 2. So. On the second graph, you see how the individual intersections generate into, uh, pairs of uh, uh, triples, Pythagorean triples, and then this table shows how the various points equate to various already discovered Pythagorean triples. If anyone anywhere ever does complete the proof, let it be known that the genius insight was Mr. Gujic's and Mr. Gujic's alone.
I, I wanted help on this one math problem, and he said, are you my mom? And I was really confused. I thought maybe he needed new glasses or something. And he said, I only have a minute to take my mom grocery shopping, so if you come back tomorrow, I'll explain it to you. I can't help but think that if he was here, he would be making fun of all of us right now and asking if anyone had a job. <laughs> Mr. Gucci was an anomaly, but a perfect anomaly. I remember another time I was also helping him clean up his classroom and he looked at my pink Floyd shirt and he said, you listen to that crap? And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, I'll give you five bonus points if you can guess how many Pink Floyd albums I have on my phone. And being a logical person, I said zero. I mean, he just called it crap. And he looked me dead in the eye. He pulled his glasses down to his nose and he said, wrong. I have seven. <laughs> I burst out laughing. Mr. Gujic was always there for me, and I will forever be grateful. He deserves the world. He was always laughing and listening through everything. He always made time for everyone, no matter how small the problem or how big the solution. And that's not an easy thing to do. He always knew what to say with the perfect balance of seriousness and humor. I would always look forward to the end of the day to help push the desk back into his room and rant about my life. And I know my rant can get annoying and hear from my friends all the time. It's crazy what a huge difference one great teacher can make on a student's life. And Mr. Gucci has single-handedly forever changed mine. I can say without a doubt that the best decision I've ever made is deciding to take his class this year. My name is Casey Matthews. I'm an English teacher here at the high school. And before Arthur went on what I dubbed his uh, Arthur Gujic oral teaching tour, he said, don't be surprised when I reach out to you for help with English. True to his word, five months into his trip, he emailed me. And for five months, I got to be a vicarious world traveler through Arthur and the Baylog family. Michael Baylog could not be here today, but he asked that I read his tribute to his longtime friend. My name is Michael Baylog. I was a pen classmate of Arthur, as well as his roommate, our junior year. My wife and three children had the distinct pleasure of circling the world with Arthur in tow as tutor. For nearly a year, he offered a master class in math, science, and social studies while imparting his voracious thirst for learning upon our children. Today, as Arthur would expect us, we are duty-bound to find the positive in the tragic. The smile through the tears, and I will try and convey a few teachings that I believe define the soul of Professor Gujic. In this small way, we can try to move forward, such that we carry him within us and do justice to his teachings, and find grace in the senseless and tragic accident that brought us here. First, I'll begin by saying that yes, students, I have those stories you might want. You know the ones I mean, like Fort Lauderdale, spring break, 1979, our sophomore year at Penn. But I decided it would not be fair now to spill the beans. Okay, fine. So let's examine exactly what caused us to need to climb out of the bathroom window of a dive bar to escape some crazed Shrek-looking boyfriend simply because we were chatting up his girlfriend as he arrived in his monster truck. <laughs> Suffice to say, we are both grateful that social media did not exist back then <laughs> and what my kids refer to as the Dinosaur Chronicles. Yes, students, we all do dumb things, even some of your teachers. Okay, for real now. It's funny the little things you remember about someone after you've known them for many, many years. 
I still recall when Arthur told me he wanted to be an astronaut. We were both about 19 or 20, his dorm wall covered in pictures of galaxies and satellites, but I'm pretty sure the Air Force fighter pilot requirement thing might have posed a problem. Airman Gujic just doesn't sound right. But Arthur was quite an insensible and insightful and sensitive guy. I remember one late night when he asked me, everyone goes to you with their problems. Who do you go to? Interesting question, no? I remember when we lived five guys in a cool off-campus house and how his desk, room, cassette tapes, pencils, calculator were all meticulously placed about his room. One day my roommate and I, while Artie was at class, ever so slightly adjusted the items, a bit left, a bit right, rearranged the order of some of the cassettes. As I'm sure you all know, upon his return, this rattled his world. He immediately noticed each modest difference and quietly went about the task of placing each item where it had been specifically placed previously. Arthur was wonderfully quirky, surely OCD, and had a terrible taste in music. And those are just a couple of the traits that made him so lovable. And man, he was smart as hell, but you knew that. I'd like to spend a bit of time, you are so gracious to allow me today, by reflecting upon the year that the professor and my family spent together where we witnessed firsthand the magic of Arthur's teaching prowess. As such, we were able to gain an understanding of the man, what motivated him, and the incredible depth and development which defined him even 40 years after our first meeting. I hope from these snippets today, you can try to enjoy Arthur's class, or what I've affectionately titled for today, Multivariable Life Lessons. Over the course of nearly one year, we observed every single thing he did and thought about. It was always about his mom, his boys, and his amazing, amazing, amazingly for the betterment of his students. He loved WhatsApp, where he could speak to his mom, Arlene, and sons, Jason and Ben. He was so proud of you boys. He'd show me tapes of Jason drumming again and again, and Ben's wonderful video work, and always checking to see if his mom is okay. You learn a lot about the core of a person when you share nearly every meal, hike, and difficulty with someone 24-7. My wife Stasia and I were able to watch firsthand as he meticulously built the coursework from scratch for a second grader, a sixth grader, and an eighth grader. Trying to reach them all, keep it relevant, while age appropriate was a Herculean task. It was almost as if we were watching a master class, a PhD opus titled, What is a Teacher? And all this while moving every few weeks between 17 countries, four continents, and countless impromptu constructed classrooms. The first lesson Arthur would surely tell you today. If you are lucky, you are lucky if you find a vocation you love. If that daily work becomes your vocation, then you are blessed. And should you find love and honor in teaching, you will live on through others forever, long after you physically depart this earth. You think Arthur loved what he did? As he so aptly put it when deciding what to teach our children. None of this population and color of the flags crap. We're going full experimental. He hand-selected relevant videos, podcasts, and scoured the locations like a Hollywood location scout for lessons at our next travel destination. And I mean, who does calculus problems for fun? Well, we took our van from the airport to downtown Hanoi. Seriously? Arthur, of course. On his little electronic scratch pad that never left his side, ready to solve a problem or explain a concept to a student. I'm sure you all know it well. One thing we heard quite often, he spoke very highly of the teachers and students here at Beachwood. He adored your engagement and what you would accomplish or had gone on to accomplish. He was very proud of his kids. And I know how much he adored the challenges, uniqueness, and intellect in his multivariable cow class. It was his pride and joy, his happy place. Honestly, I still don't know what multivariable means. But suffice to say, you all gave him life. So for Arthur, I thank you for that. As we traveled around the world, learning poured in over the transom. One important lesson we spoke of together was the enormous disparity between what we are told when we were younger and how it was so different than what we were able to learn for ourselves. First hand, in far away places, speaking to what were now no longer far away people. Were he here, he would tell you to consider, to question, 
to challenge, to accept nothing at face value. And I can assure you that sentiment comes not from modern political perspective, but through the lens of history, from his observations of the now irrefutable consequences of all long-term historical actions in Southeast Asia, and the rationalizations which we, he and I, grew up with and surrounding those military actions. He was deeply troubled by the inhumanity of it all and the lies. His takeaway lesson? Consider all viewpoints. Demonize no one. The answer to most questions is, it depends upon right, from right where you are seated. Except in his math class, of course, and he was always right. He would tell you of the elderly Japanese man outside the Peace Museum at Ground Zero in Hiroshima, Japan, who approached Arthur and said, we are sorry we made you do this to us. The perversity of that struck with him, stuck with him for months. One of my favorite pictures still today captures young Vietnamese children who came each weekend from the rural villages to learn English, approaching Arthur in the central square of Hanoi drawn almost as if they knew he was a teacher, attracted to his kind and warm instructor look, perhaps. And the scene was juxtaposed against the backdrop of toddlers driving toy tanks with American flags attached. To say Arthur's brain was bouncing from joy to confusion does not adequately convey the oddity of this Kafka-esque nature of that moment. And yet, as he rightly observed, Michael, this is insane. How can people forgive us after what we've done? These people here are so nice. So he concluded, humans have an endless, unfathomable, and inexplicable ability to forgive. Finally, on so many occasions as we traveled, Arthur would turn to me and say, how can I ever explain to people back home what this is like, what the world is really like? His conclusion, you can't really, they must experience it themselves. But that was his overriding unselfish concern. How do I impart to others the knowledge which I have gained? Now, I would never want to leave you with the impression that Arthur was all work and no play, or a dull boy, no. He had a keen sense of humor. On countless occasions, he would be lying by the pool, or ocean in Thailand, or Cambodia, or hiking in Myanmar, or Sri Lanka reading, or doing puzzles, imagine that, and turn to me with a sigh and say, do you think it's cold right now in Cleveland? I just have this feeling I should be shoveling snow. Nah. Or with dry wit, gosh, I just realized I could be back in Beechwood right now listening to some parent complain how their child deserved an 87 instead of an 86 on their exam. Whoops, somebody else's problem today, Hummer. Or perhaps, Stasia, I just looked at the time. I wonder what forms I would be filling out in a staff meeting right now if I were in Cleveland. <laughs> yep, it's true. He didn't love every aspect of being a teacher, just the teaching part. And I don't think he mind my telling you I heard those kinds of comments a lot. Not about all of you, mind you. Not every day, but almost. So, here's the most important lesson Arthur learned in the latter part of his life. And it is quite simply, perhaps, his most important lesson of all. When Arthur decided to accept our offer to travel and teach the world, he left the comfort of his Ohio life and family. We had many decisions about the risk, discussions about the risk and rewards of the position. He ultimately decided to pursue what he viewed as a once-in-a-lifetime chance to expand his knowledge and skill set and perspective. And ultimately, he thought he would be a far better and happier teacher, father, and son for doing so. Once again, it was a chance to fill his bag of skills for the betterment of others, his kids. But he risk he took, and not everyone was happy with his choice. And it reminds me of a favorite quote from the late Herb Brooks, who coached the USA Olympic hockey team, to what is now known as the miracle on ice. It is perhaps Professor Gujic's most important life lesson. Risk something, or forever sit with your dreams. In fact, the boat that we sell in the Komodo Islands off Indonesia was aptly named Carpe Diem. So how does one say goodbye to a friend, a teacher, a father, a son, perhaps even a hero? 
Truth is, you don't. Arthur was a man of high character, honorable profession, and extraordinary skill. And that really informs why you are all here today. You, like me, will never say goodbye. He lives in all of us in the roaring laughter, the quirky insights, the humor, and the life lessons we will all carry with us. They will live on for us as long as we are alive. To his students, don't waste that knowledge, but celebrate the gift you've received. Because in truth, we all stand on the shoulders of giants like Arthur. And all of our teachers to go on to higher and further than we could ever ourselves have imagined. And we are better people because of people like the professor and because he believed in you and us even when we were unsure or didn't believe in ourselves. In that sense, Arthur smiles watching us celebrate his life because today and always he and we represent, mathematically speaking, positive exponents and the long tail derivative power of great teaching. And I will miss him greatly. Thank you. social studies here and I'd like to thank Peter for pointing out that there's a good reason I did not follow the path of mathematics. Thank you. Um, I speak uh, of Arthur today uh, and obviously I'm going to start with the fact that we have lost something exquisite, um, something unique, something special. And I know that his friends, his colleagues, his students, and certainly his family have to feel that way. Um, and he had so much more to give simply by being himself. Um, that's just the kind of, of human he was. Um, but I'd like to think that for the most part, uh, what everyone's talking about here today is this, this man's incredible ability to make connections. Now, obviously, in so many ways, those connections were on Arthur's terms, uh, because I've never met him to be anything other than 100% correct. But, you know, I, I feel like I was able to share so many things with him um, just in the way he would sometimes raise an eyebrow. Uh, some people might call it a smile. I tended to call it a smirk. Um, but I was very proud to share that with him, uh, share being a colleague with him, share the hallways with him, share the students with him, in the sense that students would come to me, Mr. Purse, uh, you know what Mr. Pujic said today? Uh, no, but I can imagine. Um, and I think in some ways, uh, Arthur and I both being, um, don't want to date myself, but children of the 60s, uh, we were sort of old souls here, I think, in certain respects. Um, occasionally exhibiting a healthy or unhealthy degree of cynicism. Slightly sarcastic every once in a while. Um, but I, I'm, I'm very, very honored that Arthur had a way to see through the hypocrisy, the, the, the nonsense, the, the bullshit sometimes with a laser-like focus. Um, and I often aspired to do that as well as he did. Um, I don't know that I can come close. Um, but for Arthur, it was just one more step in, in arriving at the essence of something, the core of understanding, the, the, the embracing of a relationship. Uh, getting to the heart of it all, and, and so much about Arthur uh, was it was about heart, um, and, and I'll never forget him for that. And then the music. Um, shared so much of that wonderful style of music that we both embraced. Um, 
we would exchange, oh, did you remember that concert? And we both had to look at each other and say, mm, not as well as we may have wanted to. Um, it was a long time ago. But the, the music that he certainly embraced and the music that I embraced was, was more than just enjoying it, obviously. It, it was about hope, vision. For Arthur uh, and me, perhaps, exploration, music of imagination, um, improvisation, about being human, um, about being tolerant, about loving one another. It was that common bond, that common experience that that music brought out in us, um, whether it was listening to The Grateful Dead or The Grateful Dead, or some more Grateful Dead, or occasionally some old David Bromberg or Jefferson Airplane, things that we grew up with. Um, but it was about, and I'll circle back to the top again, making connections. And this was, was a great way to do it. Um, I was writing things down just moments before I even came up here because there's always more to say. But I want to finish with uh, two, two quotes from the two Grateful Dead songs. Um, the first one is, is for you, Arthur. It's for you. Going home, going home. By the waterside, I would rest my bones, listen to the river, sing sweet songs to rock my soul. That's for you, Arthur. And I think this one is for us. A box of rain will ease your pain, and love will see you through. I've only been here five years, and I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to teach a study hall with Arthur Gujic two years ago, uh, before his sabbatical. And like everybody, when I heard the news on Sunday, I was in shock. And I was in shock Monday and Tuesday. And for me, the only way I knew how to cope was to ask people their funny memories of Mr. Gujic because he was so funny. And the great thing about his humor was he could keep a straight face, where normally somebody's sarcastic, they, they'll crack a smile at the end to let you know they're kidding, but not Arthur, he just gives you that stare, and you guys all can see it right now. So I wanted to share a few uh, funny stories that I heard over the last couple of days. The first one, um, we were training kids on how to deal with an active shooter should they come in a classroom, and with a straight face, he told his class, um, you need to form three rows of students between me and the shooter. Because the show can't go on without me. And he paused and then said, you guys, obviously, the show can go on, but the kids, I could imagine. Um, for me, being in his class, in his study hall with him, the first couple of weeks I was getting to know him, I didn't know if he was being funny or if he was being serious. Um, like one time a kid asked, can I go to the bathroom? And Arthur said, how should I know? <laughs> and the kid's like, what? And he goes, look, if you don't know how to go to the bathroom by now, why are you asking me? Um, another time I heard a story that uh, he had in his room, a code for what to do when an administrator came in to observe them. Um, <laughs> He's, he had it, like, if, if you know the answer, raise your right hand. If you don't know the answer, you're unsure, raise your left hand. That way I won't call on you and we'll save each other some embarrassment. <laughs> One time an administrator was in and there was a student and she forgot which hand was which. And she rose her right hand by accident and he called on her and she was like, thinking, why did you call me? She didn't know the answer. And she said, oh wait, I was supposed to raise my left hand. <laughs> And afterwards, I think the administrator is like, what was that all about? And in true Arthur form, I have no idea. <laughs> um, they all, I also heard a story. He had two tissue boxes in his room. One for freshmen and one for everybody else. The freshmen weren't allowed to take tissue from the upperclassmen in the tissue box. And when a freshman did one time, he, boy, he let him have it. Um, 
Mark Hottyshell shared a story with me the other day that he was walking by Arthur's classroom and he heard Arthur teaching in a totally made up language, gibberish. <laughs> so Mark popped his head in and started talking in gibberish himself and the two of them were carrying on this gibberish conversation that kids are just going back and forth. Um, then another story I heard, uh, Mark Gray had a birthday or something, so Arthur got a birthday card that was sent to him, crossed out the people's name and it was a gang and uncle, and put his name and said happy birthday, Mark, and put it in his mailbox. It was so Arthur. Um, but it was more than just the humor, right? Because we all know when we think of Arthur, we think of Legos. When we think of Legos, we think of Arthur. And I remember the first time I walked into the building on a tour, um, I walked into the office and I see this awesome Lego replica of, of the high school. And so in my mind, I'm thinking, wow, the architectural firm must have contacted Disney, and they must have had a master Lego builder build this thing. And Lori Joyner, Lori Joyner was like, no, that was one of our math teachers. And I'm like, I've got to meet this guy. Um, and this summer, I was down in Columbus, and there's a Lego store where they have this exhibit of downtown Cleveland, Cincinnati, and Columbus, perfect Lego replicas. And I was videotaping with my phone because I couldn't wait to get back and, and share with Arthur what I had seen. Um, but it was more than just Legos. It was more than just the funny side of Arthur. As you heard earlier, he was probably one of the most phenomenal teachers that we've had here. Um, and I remember two years ago being in a study hall with him. He was redeveloping this course that had eight, name, eight words to it. Blah, 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 derivative. I think somebody had said it. And it was like... He was so passionate because he had this software and he had this online textbook and he's showing me all this stuff and I was swimming because I don't know math, but I was just to see his passion in developing this course and then, you know, get to hear stories from kids about how he reached each of them where they were. He met each of them where they were. There were no pretensions about Arthur ever. Um, so part of me, you know, again, it's hard to say goodbye and, and part of me wants to think that He's on a second sabbatical with uh, his friend, and right now he's in Malaysia, and next week he'll be in Burma. But part of me knows that he's up in heaven right now looking down. He's probably cracking jokes up there with a straight face, and God's probably looking around going, is he serious? <laughs> um, but you know what, Arthur, you were right. The show cannot go on without you, because you are one of a kind. We miss you, and we love you. Thank you. Mr. Gujic for my freshman year. There are dozens and dozens of stories I could tell about Mr. Gujic, yet quite a few notable moments that the whole school pretty much knew about. He once told everyone it was his birthday, so people brought him cake, but it wasn't his birthday at all. He also had this huge book of ways that people could cheat. He'd add to it whenever someone cheated in a new way. They cheated in a way that Mr. Gujic didn't already have, the student would get extra credit points. <laughs> I don't think that ever happened, because Mr. Gujic literally knew every trick in the book. Mr. Gujic always spoke in such a specific way. He spoke in such a way that no matter what he was saying, you would believe it. He convinced students that the little garden we have would be an aquarium. Kids would fill out surveys with animals they want to see. He would look you right in the eyes, and he never lost his poker face. If Mr. Gujic told you the sky was purple, You'd logically know it isn't, but part of you would also wonder if you've just been wrong your whole life. A human being is more than just a physical presence. A human being isn't just like a package that gets sent away and you never see again. Yes, a human being does consist of their physical, tangible presence. However, much more importantly, a human being is their stories, the lives they've lived, and the memories people have of them, and the impact that they have throughout their lives. These last few days, I've heard tons of personal anecdotes people have with him. I hear kids laughing and reminiscing while talking about the stunts that he pulled. And in these moments, I realize that Mr. Gujic will never, ever be gone. So let's mourn his physical passing, but let's celebrate the fact that he will always be here with us. We all have a piece of Mr. Gujic with us, and as long as we're here, he will be too. Thank you. Good morning. 
My name is Eric Broder. My daughter, Leah, had the honor of being in Mr. Gujic's geometry class. She's a freshman at Furman University in South Carolina and would have given anything to be able to attend this memorial. This message is from her. Mr. Gujic was a unique teacher and individual. He was witty, intelligent, successful, kind-hearted, and made math class interesting by putting his own twist on things. My classmates and I would laugh at his corny jokes, but always with the utmost respect. I learned more about life from him than just about any other person. He taught me that I should be the individual that I am and not what others think I should be, and that is exactly the way he lived his own remarkable life. When I heard about the horrible accident, my heart dropped and the world around me became foggy. In a split second, my beloved teacher's life was taken away from him and us. I cannot fully express the sorrow in my heart, nor the tremendous honor it was to be one of his students. I give all my love to Mr. Gucci's family, friends, and to the Beechwood community. Good morning. I am John Kaminsky, um, math teacher here at Beachwood High School, and was uh, Mr. Ujic's next door neighbor in the seventh and hallway. And on stage with me are the other members of the Beachwood High School math department: Lisa Morgan, Jeff Luce, Denise Pillai, Justin Cowell. <coughs> and I do want to take this opportunity on behalf of myself and. The rest of the math department will offer our condolences to uh, Mr. Gujic's family. Now, after the services today, you may be thinking, what can we do, what can I do to remember Mr. Gujic, to carry a little bit of him with me? Well, certainly one of the things you can do is, what I'm going to do now is share some stories and memories of Mr. Gujic, and to share the the stories I'm going to share with you, I think, have a little lesson, each of them, about what you could do if you want to carry a little bit of Mr. Kujic with you. Not many people know this, but Mr. Kujic and I shared a real passion for wildflowers. Um, we loved going out, looking at the wildflowers. Um, Monday mornings during the spring was quite common. We'd get together like, well, what did you see this weekend? What's blooming? Oh, that's probably not going to bloom for another week. Uh, Mr. Gujic, in his sort of OCD kind of way, actually kept records of when things were blooming and where he saw them and could compare from year to year and have an idea, okay, third week of April, I should be seeing this plant, this other plant, I'll see the first week of May. Uh, we occasionally sent pictures to each other about the plants that we had seen. Um, occasionally I send pictures to him or him to me like, what the heck is this? And try and help each other identifying the plants we had seen. Um, so if you want to remember, do something, remember Mr. Gujic, I think he'd love it to know that you just went out, put your screen down for a while, didn't worry about the next big exam, and just got out and enjoyed the natural world a little bit. Like an indulgent cliche, took some time to smell the flowers. A great place to do that um, would be North Sugar Reservation. It was his favorite park, and uh, that's actually where I plan to go this afternoon for a little while. Now, anyone that knew Mr. Gujek for a little while knew huge Grateful Dead fan. Probably less well known is that the Grateful Dead was a Mr. Gujek fan. <laughs> now, how did this come about? Well, the Grateful Dead being rather unique group, still, even today, as recently as their tour in 2015, sold a lot of their tickets mail order. And there were a lot of theories from Grateful Dead fans about what you should do on your mail order application to, have, to get seats or get better seats. Well, many years ago, Mr. Gujic sent in for a couple of tickets for a show. And they sent back the order, and there were some extra tickets that he accidentally sent them. Well, being an honest man, Mr. Gujic sent the extra tickets back with a little note explaining their mistake. Well, 
Every concert after that, Mr. Gucci, whenever he sent in mail order, always got tickets, even for the most popular sold out shows. He got sometimes really good seats, as good as first row one time. And for the recent shows in Chicago, based on his ticket order number, he was one of the first 200 orders that we filled out of the thousands. Uh, so why did they, was the Grateful Dead, Grateful Dead a fan of Mr. Gucci? Because of his honesty. So if you're looking for something else you can do to memorialize Mr. Gucci, just try and be a little bit more honest. Perhaps it'll bring you good karma, like it did for Mr. Gujic and his Grateful Dead concert tickets. But more importantly, it would be what Mr. Gujic would want you to do, and it's the right thing to do. Now, those of the math department can tell you that a typical encounter with Mr. Gujic might begin with him walking into your room one day and saying, Hey, Kaminsky! <laughs> and then talking about who knows what. But one day, a few years ago, that happened. Hey, Kaminsky, never going to believe it. I found the best place ever to hide at Beachwood High School. <laughs> no administrator, no teacher, no student will ever find me there. I'll never think to look back. And of course, he made me guess. I said, well, maybe one of the custodians gave me a ticket to the boiler room in the basement. Nah, no keys to the boiler room. Uh, maybe he found out how to get into the wrestling room. It was up there during the day. Nah, that's not it. I found it. Come on, what is it? I go to the cafeteria during lunchtime. <laughs> no teacher would ever go there voluntarily. <laughs> so no one would ever think to go for me there. <laughs> now, it turns out there's a second part to the story. He then, and I asked him, well, you eating with there? And what are you doing there? And he told me about a student that he had. A student that had some disabilities, uh, but unfortunately didn't have any friends. At least not in that lunch period. And Mr. Gujic was going in there and eating with that student. So that student had somebody to eat with. So was Mr. Gujic really that excited about hiding in the cafeteria? Was he even just was he even really hiding in the cafeteria? Was he there for some other reason? But made a joke about it, hiding in the cafeteria because he didn't want anybody to realize he was actually a really nice guy. So you want to remember Mr. Gujic, next time you see someone that's a little bit lonely, needs a friend, reach out to them, because that's what Mr. Gujic will do. Part of the reason I had the courage to come up here and speak today and um, risk crying in front of 500 people is that a few years ago at the Thanksgiving assembly, Mr. Gujic had the courage to go up and talk about this family and the loss of his brother and the support he received through the Beachwood community. And so there's a little ways from <clears throat> paying back his courage today. Now, in the Beachwood community, there's a lot of different belief systems, different beliefs about is there an afterlife? What would that afterlife look like? Perhaps we will meet Mr. Gujic somewhere down the road. If that happens, I am sure I'm supposed to think of all you wearing underwear. Okay, actually, it's not that good of this. If you encounter Mr. Gujic somewhere down the road, I'm sure he'd be happy to know that you remember the definition of a logarithm or how to solve a system of equations. But I think he'd be happier to know that because he was in your life, you took some time to enjoy the beauty of nature, to be a little bit more honest, and to reach out to somebody who needs a friend. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Jason Downey. I'm one of the school counselors here. Um, and we, the school counseling department, has the luxury of having uh, connections to the math hallway. 
So we get the luxury of having Arts cut through uh, to his classroom and also to Greta Candy out of our office and draw famous one-liners. So uh, I got to know him very quickly as I started here, walking by, dropping random side fill one-liners to me. And uh, sometimes he was very serious and he'd walk away and I would always ask the other counselors, is serious? Should I be worried? Or, and they were just, it's hard. It's hard. Um, so to add that mystique, I was actually on a weekend fishing with my children in Hudson, and I, I look up and I see Art walking towards me. What are you doing? I'm playing froth, frisbee golf. He loved frisbee golf. Um, I had no idea. It was the most random thing, and so we stopped and talked about it. And uh, we have to add up that sign club and speak. We got some obviously some one-liners. Um, and just that connection piece. From there on out, that was my first year here. Um, we had a good connection. He would share a lot with us about students. Um, sometimes we weren't sure if he was joking or if he was serious, and we'd always have to follow up. But I think that was the really interesting part. Um, and like I said, he would just come through with one-liners, and we'd be like, oh, geez, who do we need to call? This is, this is kind of a big thing. And then he'd come back a second later and say, he's joking. Um, that same year, uh, it was my first year here, um, he had me believing, I think Lena mentioned it, that we were going to have an aquarium in the courtyard. Um, I was all excited. I said, it's a perfect, you know, there's already water out here. And I honestly, and honestly thought that we were going to do that. The dead stare look on his face, I thought he was being honest. Um, so I remember going home and telling my wife, hey, they're, they're going to put fish in there, they're going to put fish in there. Um, so, I mean, just that connection piece from staff, but also the students. I had the luxury of talking to a student yesterday who meant dearly to Mr. Kuchik, and um, the student mentioned to me some of the funny things he would, he would bring up in class when he knows the students were struggling, or if he knew the student had a bad weekend, or just look on their face, saying after class. Um, and some of the students in this one student in particular said, yeah, you know, we'd have connection in class, after class, but also, you know, outside curriculum. So uh, this student happened to be in band and said, you know, I played on Friday night and he was there and he said, good job. And that's all it took. Uh, just, just recognizing our students' accomplishments and he was always there to do that. Um, and just hearing more and more student stories, um, he realized how impactful that honesty was in him. Uh, and just from everyone else, as he said today, it's just really, uh, I think, across the board, uh, that message he sent to everyone, that connection, that uniqueness, uh, just that awkwardness that kind of made everyone just talk about him and uh, made you feel comfortable and always maybe unsettled at times because you weren't sure. But, um, so that's all I have. I just, I just, uh, there's some really funny stories that when I look back and then students connect with me um, in our counseling office, how it all kind of comes together with a great person for you guys. So thank you. Superintendent, and um, I just found out that I have to go back and change some of our Bujik's evaluations. <laughs> um, <clears throat> on behalf of our Board of Education, who are here today, and all of us who work for Beechwood Schools, I want to offer, offer our deepest sympathy to Arthur Bujik's mother, Arlene, to Michelle Bujik, and sons, Ben and Jason, and to all the Bujik family uh, who are here and grieving their loss. Uh, our entire Egypt community is holding you in our hearts and wishing you strength. We also send our thoughts to the family of Barbara Becker, the other victim of this terrible tragedy. I worked closely with, with Art Egypt during the years I was principal of this high school, and I continue to enjoy my relationship with him after I took other positions in the district. I enjoyed so much about Art. Um, he was simultaneously modest, but highly confident, he was incredibly bright, but never made others feel inferior. And I always felt at ease talking to him. And I remember our conversations. They were easygoing, they were lighthearted, and they were thoughtful. Art had so many facets about himself that he liked to share, but he never sucked the air out of the room. He made me feel that there was always space for my ideas and my thoughts. And I believe these were the qualities, as you've heard many, many people talk about, that were important elements in what made him such a versatile teacher who could detect a student's struggles before they even occur. The meticulous care and the energy that he put into his teaching were evident and were always something that I appreciated. To the Gujic family, I want to express to you the admiration 
with which I and many, many others held our faith. He poured himself into his teaching, and you could feel the intensity and the pride he placed in his craft. I was once scheduling the high school, and I ran into a problem whereby I was going to have to put more than 30 students in one of Art's math sections. So I went to him, and I asked if he would prefer that I break the section, the large section, into two, and which would end up giving him six classes to teach uh, instead of the usual five in a duty period. I remember very well Art telling me that he appreciated being given the choice and that he would much rather leave that one large section. He said that he expended so much energy on a daily basis, pouring himself into the act of teaching, that he would much rather have a duty period simply to recharge mentally. And I understood what he meant, and I think everyone has who's ever seen him in action or been in his classroom. <laughs> to Ben and to Jason, I want you to know that I remember your father with admiration for his ability to hold meticulous and exacting standards while at the same time offering his students patience, and flexibility, and genuine empathy. Your dad demonstrated his appreciation for the diversity of culture and experience and ability among our students <clears> through <throat> his advocacy for them and for the second and third chances some of them might need. I remember that administrators and special ed teachers were always thankful whenever Mr. Gujic would be the teacher scheduled to attend an IEP meeting because he would put parents at ease, speaking about their ch children as unique individuals with whom he had made a connection, and also speaking with authority about their learning in his math class. He was an accepting and a non-judgmental educator. Every school would be lucky to have an art budget, and any school would be even better off to have 30 of them. To me, he is irreplaceable, and I feel fortunate to have been his colleague. And I think he would also say this friend. I appreciate your giving me time to share these five memories with you. Um, I want to thank you, all the members of the Gujic family who are here, because by doing so, you've allowed many of us to feel that we are doing something important and something meaningful under circumstances where we've often we struggle knowing what to do. So your mere presence is helpful to our school community's healing. Thank you. Um, to everyone who came to pay respects to Art Bujic, please let me offer my gratitude and that of our board members. We thank you for the amazing support that you all provide uh, to one another under difficult circumstances. A shoulder to cry on, a tight hug, a sympathetic ear, a ride home, a helping hand, and if you've been around the school in the last few days, food, food, more food, those are the characteristics of a strong community, and that's what Beachwood is. From my vantage point, working with the student support team and many other staff members over the past few days, I want to thank all of you for uh, doing whatever was needed and uh, doing what needed done for students and for your colleagues. You did so quickly. You did so without fanfare. I feel incredibly fortunate, we're all fortunate, to have so many selfless people all around us here in our school system. Uh, in my faith, Judaism, and it's true in many, many others, it is acknowledged that words cannot adequately comfort the bereaved, and so it's considered an obligation to visit those in mourning simply to be present and to offer companionship. The importance of being present with the grieving, even silently, is recognized as, a, as an important way to console. And so for this reason, I would ask for all of us at this time to simply share a moment of silence in each other's presence and to let our quiet thoughts go out to the Bujic family and to indulge ourselves in our own fondest memories of our Bujic.
this time, I would like to thank all of our speakers. Uh, at, the, at this point in our program, we have, uh, we have planned to show a video presentation that was prepared by Mr. Kevin Hutchins. Um, it's nine minutes long, so as we pull it up, um, certainly if, if you need to dismiss yourself as we approach the end of our program, you may do so, but know that this is the penultimate point in our program where we'll view the video and then we will come to a close. Thank you. I would say that most people in this school don't know me very well, even the people that I've worked with for the past 10 years. I think one of the reasons, perhaps, is that I give off this New York City attitude, or it's an aloofness, or people think that I have a mightier-than-thou attitude. Mm -hmm. But interestingly enough, it turns out that I'm nothing more than very shy, but it doesn't affect my job. It doesn't affect my teaching, per se. Let me just backtrack. Undergrad, I went to the University of Pennsylvania, spent four years there. I got a degree in math, physics, and astronomy. I was 16 when I went to college, which is a little bit young. And part of that was because I skipped kindergarten. And when all of my friends in New York took this thing called two-year SP, and you got to go through the three years of middle school in only two years. Intellectually, I could handle it. So when I headed off to college, I was 16 years old and didn't turn 17 until I was there for wow. about four or five months. It's very was definitely an issue. When I did typically date my first and second year of college, it was typically by going to the local high schools and finding girls that were my own age. And to them, that was wonderful also. They felt like they were dating a college guy. And I was really happy because I was dating people my own age. So that's how that worked. Although I, I will tend to sometimes brag about what I build, um, I, I don't do it very often. But I do brag about my math teaching. I've been a math teacher of high school and middle school for about 25 years. I view myself as this absolutely amazing math teacher. I take kids that hate mathematics in ninth grade algebra, and by the time that I'm done with them, their next year, they're doubling up in math. They're actually making an active choice to take two math classes after being so successful with me in algebra. And it's not that I'm an easy teacher. I'm a very difficult, rigorous teacher, but I love teaching. I call myself the sage on stage, so I like to entertain. I like to have fun with the kids. I like to tell stories. I like to tell jokes. And in between all of it, I'm teaching some high-level mathematics. There's some good philosophies out there that the way we communicate with one another is by telling stories. And the validity, the truth of any story is always subjective. So is it really important whether or not I was on an episode of CSI or not? <laughs> whether or not I did hurt my legs skydiving? Whether or not I was a Navy SEA? I mean, all these things about my past, uh -huh. do they really affect no. the mathematics? They don't. Again, it's a teaching tool to engage students to make it more interesting. I mean, come on, man, it's pretty boring. So might as well spice it up a little bit sometimes. And it's never off the cuff. If you actually looked at my lesson plans, I actually have the jokes written into the lesson plans. So if you took my algebra course one year and failed it and had to take it the next year, same joke. you would find that the same jokes, the same lines, the same stories appear basically at the same lessons at the same time. Well, I do try out new material every once in a while, and if it works, I'll add it to my repertoire. But again, it's like any performer. You've got a set piece, and I look at my job as even harder than a performer, because not only do I need to keep you engaged and entertained, but I also have to make sure that I'm teaching you, that I'm getting knowledge across. So, I'm an AFOL, A-F-O-L, an adult fan of LEGO. And I've been playing with Lego since 1967, when I was seven years old, adult fans, at some point in their life, stopped playing with Lego, usually around the age of 14 or 15, when other things take precedence, such as girls, cars, and sports. And then, sometime later on in their life, typically when they have their own kids, they get back into the hobby and start playing again. And that period of time, when you're not playing with Lego, that's called your dark ages. Well, for me, I never, ever stopped playing with Lego. I had Lego pieces in the 80s, the 90s, the, the 2000s. 
I had kits all over the place. Whenever people were coming over, they would constantly see me playing with Lego. So I don't say that I had a dark ages. I call it more of a dim ages. So back in 2005, mm -hmm. I took the hobby a little bit more seriously. I started building a model of the house that I lived in. I then built a model of the Terminal Tower building, which is actually right now at CSU's Rose Library wow. on permanent display. Then I built a model of the Taj Mahal, and I brought it to a Lego convention. Yes, there are Lego conventions. <laughs> And I won a first place. And since then, over the past seven years, I've attended about 16 or 17 conventions. And in every convention, I've won a first place prize. And when you keep winning and people keep enjoying your work, of course, course. keep going at it. Love computer science. I can program in a number of different languages. Really? When I was younger, loved sports, loved football, basketball. I enjoy reading. I mean, I read about two or three books a month. That's pretty good. Mostly science fiction, historical books, that kind of genre. I'm actually writing a book. I started writing a book many years ago, and every four or five years, I pick it up and write a couple more chapters. It's called Keep a Door Open and a Light On, and it's about a very interesting time of my life when I was in my mid-twenties. I also have a love of nature, love of hiking in the woods, and about 25 years ago, I took it upon myself to learn all the names of the trees and the wildflowers. So one of the things that I do when I take hikes, and also one of the reasons that nobody likes to go hiking with me, is that anytime I see some sort of plant or tree or whatever, I will stop and log it. So over the past 25 years, I've identified close to 5,000 different species wow. of trees and wildflowers throughout the United States. This is your favorite place in the world where I grew up, New York City. I try to go back there about two or three times a year. Mm -hmm. I just love going there. I love bringing people there also. I'm a wonderful tour guide. Last time I was there, and I brought some friends up to the top of the Empire State Building, and I'm walking around showing them this is the Flatiron Building, that's the uh, Washington Square Park. Uh -huh. And the next thing I realized is that I had like a group of seven or eight people that were following me <laughs> because nobody knows what they're looking at when they're at the top of the Empire State Building, unless, of course, you're a native New Yorker. And I do have one band in particular that I have listened to since the 70s, and we're talking about a group called the Grateful dead. Okay, well there's the time that oh no, I can't tell that one. <laughs> Alright, well I can't, no I can't tell oh, that man, one. Oh man, wow. <laughs> well, you know, my philosophy of life and one of the philosophies is that things that occurred more than 25 years ago should have no bearing on your person anymore. Okay. Any of those stories clearly do not influence who I am or what I'm about. Two kids, two okay. boys. Ben is in ninth grade mm -hmm. and Jason is in seventh grade. Uh -huh. Ben is very articulate. He's sort of like a 15-year-old going on 25. He'll probably be a lawyer when he grows up. Awesome. And the younger one, Jason, who's 12, is an amazing drummer. One of the things that I do with Jason every second or third week on Fridays, mm -hmm. him and I go to see nightclubs or <laughs> bars where music is being played. <laughs> it's totally inappropriate for him to be there for the most part, but I'll have a root beer or a ginger ale, mm -hmm. and we just sit down and we listen to music together That's for about an hour or two until he gets you know, tired. It's a wonderful thing that him and I do together, and I'm letting him see all these different types of music that typically a 12-year-old wouldn't see. You know, right now, if you're asking me that, I will tell you that I have predicted snow days with 98% accuracy. Sure, the secret is, is that 93% of all statistics are made up on the spot. Mm. So people remember what they want to remember. Okay. So whenever I predict a snow day and it comes true, mm -hmm. people remember those. Yeah. People tend not to remember the snow days that I've predicted that have not come true. So I will give you my secret. It's called the Weather Channel. It's called looking at the weather and then changing the percentages on the outside as the weather channel changes theirs. Say no more. <laughs> but that's a secret. Don't let anybody know. When I think back to my high school teachers, mm -hmm. I do not remember what I scored on my fifth algebra test. What I do remember is whether or not they were kind. Mm -hmm. What I've noticed is that everybody remembers their algebra teacher. So 20 years from now, I want all the kids that I've had to look back when they say, who is your algebra teacher? They'll say right away, Mr. Gucci, he was a good teacher. He was kind, he was funny, he was enjoyable. Something positive about me. Because in the long run, most of the math that I'm teaching anyway 
is fairly useless. The same, yeah. same thing even when I was in media class. I never knew I wanted to do yeah. this until I was a senior in college, and then I started working for the TV station. Cool. All right. Um, do you mind just uh, look? You can just look at me, and you, do you mind just saying and spelling first and last name for me, please? Okay. Uh, Eli Goldman. E L I G O L D M A. Cool. And Eli, you're a senior. Yep. Senior at Beachwood High School. Cool. And um, first, uh, first and foremost, sorry about the loss of um, Thank Mr. You. Uh If you don't mind, just tell me a little bit about him. Okay. Um, well, uh, I had him my sophomore year uh, for geometry, and uh, I mean, he was, a, he was a different type of teacher. Like, he had his own uh, teaching style. Um, he would start every day off with a different joke. Uh, like, one day, he, uh, he just looked so mad. Like, he was all staring us, he was staring us all down when we walked in class. And, um, like, he, he just stood there with a plate of Legos in his hand. Like, they were all, like, in pieces, and he said, who broke this? Well, like, this was in the back of the class yesterday, and someone broke it. And uh, we're all just, like, looking at each other like, I don't, I, don't know who, I don't know who did this. And uh, he just stands there for five minutes just staring everyone down. He's like, I'm going to wait until someone tells me who did this. And uh, after like ten minutes of him just staring at us, he says, okay, let's start class. And everyone's like, what? What just happened? And he's like, oh, I was just waiting for someone to say it. I, this was never a, anything that was built. I was just waiting for someone to take responsibility for it. Um, but that's really getting, kind of yeah. sums him up a little bit of just oh, having yeah. that, that humor, character, but also yeah, yeah. how did that keep you engaged in the classroom and make you um, learn better? I mean, I had him last period, and usually last period, you're just, like, eager to go home, like, I just want to get out of here. But, um, like, in his class, like, it'd feel like 10 minutes, and then the bell rang, and I'm like, that's it? Like, I want more? <laughs> like, he told so many funny jokes, and, like, he would tell the funniest joke, and everyone would be laughing and, like, crying, and, like, crying out of laughter, obviously, and, um... Like, he'd just be standing there staring at you, like, what's so funny? Like, 
Um, that's just his character. And like I, I work in the auditorium, and like this morning I came in early to set up, and uh, everyone's just walking in, so sad. Like nobody was talking, um, and now everyone's leaving after this after this event, and everyone's laughing, smiling, talking. Um, I think that just speaks to his character. Do you think that's how he would want to be remembered? Oh yeah, yeah. Like when I first like people were like saying like someone died at this school, and like they were saying like it's probably like they thought it was Mr. Gujic, and I was just like. Like that, that cannot, like, I just could not believe it. Like, I, at first I thought it was a joke, like, he's gonna be there, like, I'm like, he's gonna be there tomorrow. But uh, when he wasn't, it was, it was weird. Um, like, all the teachers, like, obviously they were hurt because everyone was good friends with him. Um, so we didn't really have, like, serious classes. Like, everyone knew that everyone was in pain. But uh, there was that, that everyone was asking, like, to tell stories about him, tell what he, like, funny things that he did, and, like, that just, like, everyone would just smile in class. Like, that was, I don't know, that was, it was pretty hard to go through, but uh, I'm so happy that, like, people are there for me and, like, people can laugh about, like, the stories that he that he was involved in. Wrapping up here real quick, what, mm -hmm. what's his lasting legacy on the school and what he'll be remembered for? Um, like, <laughs> he did so many jokes on, like, the general population at school. Like, he convinced everyone that, uh, that a little garden we had was going to be uh, a shark tank. Um, so I guess if they could just present like a, like that little garden maybe in his memory or something like something important like that um, because a lot of people are going to be coming to the school that don't really know who he is um, and that legacy is going to be around for a while so I think if we can just keep that story around saying like who he was and why we're remembering him that's uh, that'll be important to it'll be just important yeah <laughs> anything else you want to add uh, no I just I just think that he's a, he's a great person and his character will be remembered by everyone at the school. Ram, you got anything? Yeah, cool. yeah, thank you. Thanks, man. We appreciate you. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. Good luck. Thank you very much. Where are you going?